sure got hushed all of a sudden, didn't it? Good morning. It's good to see all of you. You don't act like it's good to see all of you, but that's okay. Thank you very much. Happy Father's Day to you all. God bless us, everyone. Uh, we're uh, going to begin our worship with our first reading from Scripture this morning. It comes from the Gospel of Mark, and Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 35. On that day, when evening came, Jesus said to them, Let's go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him, and there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Now Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. The wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are here to worship our Lord this morning. And he calls us to worship him, whether it is in the clear skies or in the stormy ones. So I invite you right now, if you would, to rise to your feet and let us proclaim our glory to God forever. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the king of kings, yeah you were, yeah you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things, angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever, glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God forever. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days, all my days. So let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. We sing glory to God, glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. 
Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun is shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Maybe seated. It has.
it is Father's Day, I invite you, if you would, to pray together as God's people for our fathers, giving thanks for them and wishing that uh, uh, they have uh, a, a blessed day today and all days. You will see your part when it comes up on the screen as the congregation of God prays together. We give our thanks, Creator God, for the fathers in our lives. Fatherhood does not come with a manual, and reality teaches us that some fathers excel while others fail. We ask for your blessings for them all and forgiveness where it is needed. So, too, we remember all those who have helped fill the void when fathers pass early or are absent. Grandfathers and uncles, brothers and cousins, teachers, pastors and coaches, and the women of our families. Amen. We wish to praise the God of wonders, who is the eternal Father for us. So I invite you, if you would, to join me by singing, standing, and then singing together of the God of wonders. Lord, reveal your heart to me. 
From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name You are amazing God All powerful Untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, You are amazing God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun and gave source to its light? Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing god all powerful untamable all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing god You are amazing God. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, all struck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, You are amazing God. You are amazing God. Let me see. When you wear the monitor, you never not quite know where it's at. <laughs> I said a moment ago that we, we acknowledge it's Father's Day, and this is going to seem like a very odd Father's Day passage. It's the Old Testament reading for today, and it is odd, <laughs> and yet it's not odd. I think for people, fathers, parents, whomever, young people even, that have found themselves um, wondering where is the presence of God through whatever is happening in their life, this text is extremely profound. It is towards the end of the story of Job, which we will get into in just a moment, and we're just going to read the first 11 verses, but continue to talk about the whole story of Job. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now, gird up your loins like a man, and I'll ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who set its measurements, since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? 
on what were its bases sunk or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. When bursting forth it went out from the womb, when I made a cloud its garment and thick dar darkness its swaddling band. And I placed boundaries on it and set a bolt and doors, and I said, Thus far you shall come, but no farther. And here shall your proud waves stop. God answers us. This is a time for our children's moment. If any of our young people who are present want to join me down in the corner here for a children's moment, come on down. Hey, guys. You're looking good, almost like a year older. Have a seat. How are we doing today? What is today? Father's Day. Did y'all have a good Father's Day this morning? Yeah? You woke up and you did what? See him where he was at? Was he in bed still? He was on the couch. When you woke up, he's in the bed. When you woke up, he was on the couch, so he'd moved. That's good, though. You got to go, and you wished him a happy Father's Day. Do you notice my tie? This is a, yeah. This tie has a handprint on it, doesn't it? That is the handprint of my son, Sean, back on Father's Day in 1995. Wow, that's a long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a long time. You're, you're doing the math. <laughs> yeah. When you get older, you don't want to do the math. But right now, you're probably doing the math. Well, you know, right now, he will be 31 in November. So he's gone from this little handprint to a big ham hock of a hand. You know, big, like mine, exactly. Sills Vienna sausages right there. That's right. So it's, it, it's true. It's true. We kind of grow up. And then, you know, someday, you know, they may be, he may become a father, too. Or he might have a date. But either way, it'll work out. <laughs> and uh, so I just, uh, <laughs> to you, too. <laughs> but, but the key thing is, as a father, we're not always perfect. We make mistakes. We do things wrong. But the biggest thing is that we love our sons and our daughters, our children, Right? Sometimes they love us rather harshly, but sometimes they, we need that, don't we? Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. Why'd you look back? I said, <laughs> so, well, we want, what we want to do is we give thanks to God for every good gift. So today, let's thank God for our fathers, okay? Let's bow together in prayer. Lord God, thank you for our fathers. Thank you that they love us. And that's more than enough of what we can do as dads. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, are you gonna, Jamie's going to go with you, take you guys, if you want to, to Children's Church. Is that okay? He's going to take you over to the Children's Church area. Oh, they're back in the back going, yeah, go. <laughs> Don't do that for you. <laughs> okay. <sighs> As I confessed a moment ago, it is not the normal passage, but it is something that struck me as I was reading it. And actually, I planned something else for today, but this had kind of hit me on uh, Monday or, or so. I asked the question, is anybody there? Because it's that time of year. It's Father's Day, but it also means when it's Father's Day that we are coming closer to July 4th and Independence Day, which uh, if you haven't looked on Facebook, we're not going to be having the picnic at, on July 4th. We had a lot of people out of town, a lot of people with pre-planned, so we will push that to a later date. But with Independence Day looming, by the way, we're talking about the revolutionary one, not the one where the aliens invade the planet and uh, th Jeff and all those guys go and save us from whoever those invaders were. But it's time for me almost every time th of this year to pull off one of my favorite musicals. 
No, it's not Hamilton. Uh, though it might end up being one of my favorites if I ever sit down and get to watch the whole piece as one. I'm talking about the musical 1776 with William Daniels. Uh, by the way, you know him as Mr. Feeney for some of the younger people. William Daniels uh, playing a uh, beleaguered, battered, bombastic John Adams who desperately wants these American colonies to declare independence and become a new nation. One of the most powerful scenes to me is following an antagonistic moment when the southern delegations have walked out because of an anti-slavery clause in Jefferson's document. And as they get together to plan what next, he sends Franklin to Ben Franklin to go talk to his Pennsylvania delegation and try to make them come over into voting yes. He asked Thomas Jefferson, who's also a Southerner, to talk with Rutledge from South Carolina and see if they can reason something together. The chamber grows dark, and it becomes very quiet, which is unusual. Adams reflects on the Titanic struggle that seems so close, and yet now it seems so far away, possibly even gone. And the result is he feels utterly alone. Now, as in any good musical, when such moments happen, they begin to sing. And John Adams begins to sing. Is anybody there? Does anybody care? Does anybody see what I see? He continues to transform his negative into resolve. They want me to quit. And they say, John, give up the fight. But still to England, I say, good night forever, good night. Is anybody there? Does anybody care? Because much of Job is written in such a style, too, you could almost say that Job is singing his song unto God, and now God sings a climactic song. Job has been singing back and forth in dialogue with his so-called friends, and he has been saying the same thing. Is anybody there? In case you're not familiar with the whole story, I'll try to get it going for you. Job was the richest man around, we're told. But in a single day, one day, Everything of his life was wiped out. The Sabians ran off with his donkeys and oxen, and they slaughtered the hired hands who had been keeping them. Lightning struck his barn, and all the sheep that were in it were burned up, not to mention the shepherds who took care of them for him were killed in the disaster. The Chaldeans rustled his camels and made short work of the camel drivers who took care of them for him. And then a hurricane hit, a great wind, with such devastating effect that the house where his seven sons and three daughters were having a celebration and party, there was none of them left in the wreckage. Nothing to even identify. What happened next was that Job came down with a form of leprosy. Most translations seem to call it boils, but... For that day and time, any skin aff affliction or skin infection was a disease that was included and continued to be called leprosy. More importantly, if you had leprosy, you were unclean to others, particularly God. What happened after that was that he cursed the day that he was ever born. Job said that if he had his way, he would have it stricken off the calendar entirely and have himself never so much as mentioned again. He prayed to die, but his heart went on beating. He prayed for the sun to go out like a match, but it kept on shining. His wife advised him to curse God. Go hang yourself afterwards, too. <laughs> but he stopped just short of that because he was a very good man, a very righteous man. And there were some links to which even though he was almost out of his head with the horror of it all, he couldn't quite bring himself to go. 
And that was the crux of the problem, really. In fact, the problem was he was a very good and a very righteous man. In the very beginning of the story, before we even hear Job speak, we see the court of God, and God says he's a good and righteous man. The person who's telling the story, the narrator, says, and Job was a good, upright, and righteous man. And yet here he is. Why had God su let such things happen to him? Now, he had four. Three in the beginning and another one shows up. Well-meaning but insufferable friends who came over to cheer him up and try to explain it for him. They said that anybody with enough sense to come in out of the rain knows that God is just. And they said that anybody who is old enough to spell his own name knew that since God was just, he made bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people. And they said that being the case, you don't need a Harvard diploma to figure out that since bad things happen to Job, then ipso facto, you must have done something. Somewhere bad. But Job hadn't. And Job knew he hadn't. And Job said so to them. Pleaded with them, that is not the case. But that's not all Job said either. He looks at them, and I love his phrasing. Worthless physicians are you all. <laughs> Quacks. Oh, that you would just keep silent and it would be your wisdom. In other words, I wish you were smart enough to hush. They were a bunch of theological quacks, in other words, and the smartest thing they could do was shut up, and yet they were too busy explaining everything to listen to what Job was saying. Eliphaz, one of those friends, the Timonite, proceeded to make a few helpful suggestions about some of the bad things that maybe Job, maybe you did these and it slipped your mind. Uh, maybe you robbed a few beggars of the rags on their backs one time. Uh, maybe, he argued, you, you must have refused food to some poor individual who was starving to death, and you just didn't know they were starving to death. Uh, another thought, uh, Job, is that maybe there must have been several widows and orphans that you didn't know, but the decisions you made ground them under your heel. Job wouldn't even dignify those accusations with a response. Instead, he talked about God. He talked about God instead. There had been a time, he said, when God and he had been like that. And he held up side by side those two infected fingers that were almost gangrenous by now. There was a time, he said, when his lamp shone upon my head. And by his light I walked through darkness when the Almighty was with me and when my children were about me, or you might say he was saying a lot. And then he had to stop for a few minutes and blow what was left of his nose before going on. <laughs> the question he said once he'd had time to pull himself back together was, where is God now? He says, I looked for him in the front. He wasn't there. I looked for him in the rear, and he wasn't there. I looked to my left. I looked to my right. He wasn't there. If he only knew, he argued, where God might be keeping himself, then maybe, just maybe, he'd go tell him his troubles, and he would get an explanation at least. But God had made himself scarce as hen's teeth. And looking for him was like looking for a needle in a haystack. It eluded him. My skin turns black and falls from me, Job says. And then he took advantage of a long speech and derision by another friend named Elihu to change a few of his dressings and wounds. 
Elihu went over many of the same points his colleagues had already ticked off, and then he added the idea that perhaps the destruction of all your property, Job, and the death of all your children and your own leprosy and physical health was probably, it's just God's way of helping you improve your character, sharpen your sensitivities. He says to Job, he delivers the afflicted by their afflictions and opens their ears by adversity. I remember the great Christian writer C.S. Lewis felt the same way about suffering until he was married to joy and joy was eaten up with cancer. And suddenly he discovered that suffering was not some laboratory experiment to prove faithfulness. It was just suffering. Then suddenly, Job has no chance to respond to this new and comforting insight <laughs> because there's another speaker. And this speaker takes center stage right where we started. The speaker was God. Just the way God showed up and cleared his throat, blasted Job off his feet. And that was just for starters along the way. It's the most beautiful speech that God makes in the whole Old Testament. And it's composed almost entirely of the most gorgeous and preposterous questions that have ever been asked by God or anybody else. God begins to, to say to Job, to us, have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Where is the dwelling of light, God says? Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or, or has the reign of Father? Can you bind the chain of the Pleiades in the sky? Now, by this time, God was just starting to get wound up. It goes on and on for a while. Is the wild ox willing to serve you, he asked? Will he spend the night in your crib? Will the wings of the ostrich wave proudly? But are they pinions and plumage of love? Have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder, who says among the trumpets, Ha ha, it smells the battle afar off? Or does the hawk fly by your wisdom and stretch her wings towards the south? There was only, obviously, one thing for Job to say, and thank God Job said it. Behold, Lord, I am of small account. What shall I ask and answer thee? I will proceed no further. But God wasn't through. You can think of God perhaps as a great cosmic bully at this point. You know how it is when you hope your dad, since it's Father's Day, is through with the lecture? And he's not. Well, God does the same kind of thing here. He's instead of a bully, though, a great cosmic kind of artist, a singer, you might say, of such power and magnificence. You get so caught up in the incandescence of his own art as he talks about it, he doesn't notice that the eardrums of those he's speaking to are bursting at this time. And he looks at Job and says, Have you not an arm like God? flexes his guns and can you thunder with a voice like this then he launched off on this wonderful devastating aria about behemoth and the hippopotamus he had made and the leviathan and the crocodile he had made and challenges job or anybody else who might be listening if they thought they could to you know take them out for a walk on a leash sometime and see how far you go Job wasn't the only one who cries out, though. Is anybody there? You see, throughout the scriptures and throughout our lives and human experience long before us, it is the question that at some point raises itself to us. Look back at the story from Mark 4 that we read at the very beginning and think about it. In, in those closing verses, 
we're told that a fierce gale of wind developed and the waves are breaking over the boat so much, what? That the boat is filling up with water. And yet Jesus himself is in the stern. And he is not just in the stern, he is asleep. And he's not just asleep, he is asleep on the pillow. I don't know what kind of pillow, but it was a pillow. And they wake him up, and they say to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Mark's use of historic present words reveals them to be rough and indignant. Jesus is right there in the boat with them, and yet here are the disciples, no different than Job, lamenting in the same cry of fear and need that Job had cried. Is anybody there? Is anybody care? And if we're honest, it's left our lips more than once sometime. It is raw fear. The visceral response of anyone who finds himself or herself in a frail, storm-tossed boat on the seas or even on the land like Job. Job and the disciples and sometimes me and sometimes you. We cannot see if anybody is there because we cannot see from our narrow view. All we perceive is that something is wrong and, and that something wrong needs to be set right and we want answers now and we want God to write it so clearly as if he used the sky as a computer screen for a Word document and typed it all for us to see and know that we are not alone. That somebody is there and God shows up. And the dialogue with Job continues. Job says, I've uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. And then he said something else. He, all his life, he says, I've heard about you, God. I've heard about your glory and your holiness. I've heard about your terrible wrath and your great mercy. And I've heard about the way that you created the earth and all of its creatures and the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky. There would always be light to see by and beauty to gladden the heart. Job said, I had sometimes thrilled and sometimes trembled at the sound of just these descriptions. And they made such an impression on Job. That not even the terrible things that had happened to him or the terrible question as to why they had happened. Or the curse that God has been suggested. There were a few times when he came uncomfortably close to ending that. But now it was no longer a matter of hearing descriptions of God. He says, I've seen and heard you for myself. You came and I know you. He had seen the great glory so shot through with sheer fierce light and, and life and gladness. Had heard the, the great voice raised in song. So full of terror and yet so full of wildness and beauty. That from this moment on nothing else mattered to Job. All possible questions melted like mist in the sun's dawning. And all possible explanations withered like grass. And the bad times of his life, together with all the good times of his life, were so caught up into the fathomless life of God that, he, that God would bend down to speak with me. And I, I am just a fleck of dust on the head of a pin in the lapel of a dancing flea. And all Job could say was, I'd heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see, and I despise myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. But God didn't let Job despise himself for long. He turned to the garrulous friends, and he said, you haven't come close to speaking for me and what is right by me against my servant Job. In a sense, he's saying Job was right all along. Y'all should have listened to him and shut up. And then he gave back, we're told, to Job more riches than he had ever had together before with his health. And Job lived 
to see a whole new set of children and to see them through four generations before he died off old and full of days. As for the children he had lost when the house blew down, not to mention all of his employees, he never got an explanation for them. Because when he finally met God, he never asked for one. And the reason he never asked for one was that he knew that even if God gave him one, one that made splendid sense of all the pain and suffering that had ever been since the world began, it was no longer splendid sense that he needed anymore. Because with his own eyes he had beheld God, not as a stranger, but as the one in whom he was clothed and all things were clothed. No matter how small or confused in pain with his own splendor, God clothed Job, even when Job didn't know it. And that was more than sufficient. Job sought legal terms. God says, that's a little small. I think in terms of the cosmos. Human theories are nice, but they can't possibly capture what I can do or contain it. God's rebuttal never actually answers the totality of Job's question. No explanation or reason shared. As Barbara Bound Taylor put it in her book, Home by Another Way, she said, Job's question was really about justice. God's answer is about omnipotence. And as far as I know, that is the only answer human beings have ever gotten about why things are and happen the way they do. God only knows, she said, and none of us is God. Is anybody there? Does anybody care? God says, yes. And then somewhere, somehow, God shows up and taps us on the shoulder. But for God, a tap is so great and forceful, he nearly knocks us down without meaning to. And he reveals, here I am. I'm right here, and I care more than you can fathom. But God's answers are not to our questions. God's answer is the answer to our souls. We will walk by faith and not by sight, as we talked about last week in Corinthians. And we must be content with God's presence. And I have found that to be enough. Thank God. Bow with me in prayer. Lord, our lives reek of questions and confusion. Our minds race in chaos and complexity. Oh, Lord, we have so many questions. But answer us, not in detailed, logical systems. Answer us in the holy presence of your grace and your never-ending loving kindness and mercy. For in the name of the Christ, who likewise was you in flesh, came down not just for Job, not just for those who lived in Palestine in the first century, but Lord, he came for all of us that we may find hope in your salvation, grace in your forgiveness, and life, even in the midst of death. Amen. I invite you this morning to stand with me. We're going to end with a, a full song. You may stand now. Uh, <laughs> that you're quite familiar with.
and I think is the perfect way for this worship time to end. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Could we with ink the oceans fill And were the skies of parchment made Were every stalk on earth a quill And every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. not forget to stick around and fellowship with one another both down here and upstairs if you would like uh, with coffee and some pastries now go and know that no matter the storm or the journey or the struggle God makes himself known to us and that is enough amen